welcome everybody to this session on global action on financial integrity to achieve the SDGs and welcome that to those who are joining us online as well. Uh, I saw as I came in that the room has a capacity of 888, so I'm glad that we have a capacity crowd tonight. Um, I'm Sarah Lister, I'm Head of Governance at UNDP, uh, and I'm delighted to moderate this session. It is actually the first in-person session I have moderated since before the pandemic, so that is, that is uh, quite exciting that we have this opportunity again. Um, uh, we are here to discuss the issue of illicit financial flows, which divert scarce resources away from development through corruption, criminal activity, commercial tax evasion, and mispriced commercial transactions. According to the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, Africa lost 1.3 trillion of illicit financial flows from 1980 to 2018. So curbing these flows could generate enough resources by 2030 to finance almost 50% of the 2.4 trillion needed by sub-Saharan African countries for climate change adaptation and mitigation. So while we talk a lot and have talked a lot about domestic resource mobilization, uh, ODA and the quality of private investments playing a huge role in development country, developing country financing, significant gains could also be made by strengthening these efforts to curtail illicit financial flows, bribery and corruption. And that's what we're going to talk about today. This session has been jointly organized by UNDP and Norway, and thank you to Norway for co-organizing this event together with us. Um, we also have with us people, colleagues from uh, Global Financial Integrity, Open Ownership, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, and we're going to discuss progress, gaps, and challenges in addressing illicit financial flows. Also, the strategies and recommendations for various stakeholders to promote coordination and policy coherence. I hope that we'll have the opportunity to get quite practical, and I also hope that if all the speakers keep to time, we'll have a chance to have something of an interactive discussion and debate amongst ourselves. So the format for us uh, this evening is that there'll be short opening remarks from UNDP and Norway, and then we'll have a discussion with our five panel members and then questions and answers. So uh, without, without further ado then, I'll let, we'll hand over to Francine Pickup, who is, uh, I shouldn't need to look up her I can title say because I she's my boss, <laughs> but she's a Deputy Assistant Administrator, Deputy Director, Bureau for Policy and Programme Support of UNDP. Francine. It really is a mouthful, so I don't blame you. Even I trip up on my title sometimes. So um, we're at the end of day two, so we've really got the hardcore uh, committed colleagues. So thank you very much for joining us for this session. I'd really like to thank NORAD as well for co-organizing this session with us. Uh, we look forward to the discussion around, as Sarah said, current progress, gaps, and challenges in how we address issues related to financial integrity, including tax transparency, fiscal transparency, procurement and contract transparency, and beneficial ownership transparency. We live, as we've heard many times over the last couple of days, in very turbulent times. As societies uh, are under pressure from COVID, from the ripple effects of the war in Ukraine, and from the climate and nature stresses, we see people's growing dissatisfaction with the performance and the outcomes of governance systems. And I don't know, many of you may have seen it, but UNDP's recent Global Human Development Report that was launched back in September this year highlights really that we are in an unprecedented age. We have seen for two years in a row the Global Human Development Index fall, setback. That's never happened before. And the uh, report also uh, stated that six in seven people around the world, regardless of where you live, have a feeling uh, of, of insecurity. So we are in a new time of what we call an uncertainty complex. And corruption not only deepens this uncertainty complex, 
but also impedes peace and security by exas exacerbating fragilities and inequalities in our societies and reducing people's confidence and trust in public institutions. So the issue of financial integrity is really core to this issue of fighting corruption. Transparency International defines financial integrity as a financial system that operates in a clean, transparent and accountable way. For UNDP, financial integrity is essential for service delivery, it's essential for development finance, and it's very important for people to have trust in the public institutions around them. Between 2004 and 2013, the developing world lost approximately $7.8 trillion to illicit financial flows. Countries are losing $483 billion in potential tax revenue every year. This could have fully vaccinated the global population against COVID more than three times over. And according to UNCTAD, an estimated 80 88 billion leaves the African continent alone in illicit financial flows every year. Those countries with high illicit financial flows spend 25% less on health, 58% less on education compared with countries with low illicit financial flows. But it's not the monetary or material impact that we're actually most concerned about here. The non-material, indirect impact of, uh, of this corruption is far more significant and destructive. So when high-level officials exploit vast amounts of public assets, public trust erodes, people are deprived of economic opportunities, and government, uh, democratic institutions are weakened. So, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, Member state commitments to the UNGAS 2021 political declaration need to, these, these declarations, these commitments need to be transformed into concrete actions. And I'd like to mention two uh, to, to you here. The first is the global community can discuss the establishment of an international convention on tax and financial integrity to set consistent and multilateral standards for financial and beneficial ownership transparency. As the UN Convention Against Corruption has made substantive impact for 20 years, a new convention could be a game changer to strengthen financial integrity. And then second, we need strong international cooperation and assistance for the prevention of corruption and the enforcement of rule of law. This is critical for um, advancing financial integrity. So working together with our partners, UNDP is committed to playing an important convening role in bringing together different actors, different sectors and stakeholders to tackle this global agenda, and particularly bringing together the economic governance group or set of expertise with the more traditional governance expertise. That integration is critical. At the global level, we'll continue shaping global understanding on effective economic governance and financial integrity through advocacy, knowledge, and policy research. And then at the country level, we support developing strategies to prevent and address illicit financial flows, promote transparency in, be uh, in beneficial ownership, public procurement practices, budgets, contracts, and taxation, and strengthen data collection, another really important area on illicit financial flows and corruption in line with SDG 16. So in line with our, the message of International Anti-Corruption Day, we look forward to uniting with you against corruption. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francine, for, for highlighting the development uh, implications of the, of the topics that we're talking about this evening, but also the, the sort of broader governance framing for it, that we are not only just talking about financial flows that are outwards from a country, but we are also talking about flows within countries and from into countries that also um, set the stage for the political corruption and the decline in institutions, uh, trust in institutions and the decline in, in democratic 
uh, governance that we see globally as well. So the second set of opening remarks are from Lisa Stensrud, who is the policy director, a uh, policy director at the Norwegian Agency Development uh, for Development Cooperation. Sorry, NORAD. Uh, I would just note that everybody's bios is are online, so I'm not going to spend much time. But please do look up um, people's bios because they have a fascinating background. Lisa, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure for me to be invited on behalf of Nora to say a few opening words and remarks. Uh, the challenge when I speak after her is that she mentioned all the good points. Uh, so you may have, and, and, and you also been to all a, a lot of other panels, and I think we talk about the same things a lot. Um, and for me to talk about financial integrity, or for Norwegians, we don't even have a word in Norwegian that covers that very well. So we have to use a long road of words to actually explain it, and it's still quite difficult. Eh? Uh, integrity, we understand. The financial integrity, you know, we need to, a, a lot more to explain. And we often mix it also with other type of integrity, you know, it's, uh, it's difficult to distinguish it because it, it's really closely related with other uh, elements as well. Governance for us is, 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 uh, is, it is a key sustainable, uh, it's a key for sustainable development and for safeguarding human rights. Huh? And with the SDGs now appearing increasingly out of reach, the state of governance is a first order development challenge. Uh, there are many of us now that starts to get uh, um, be very worried about what is happening and particularly with what we see uh, in the society now with a combination of complex crisis including social and economic impacts of the pandemic, the climate change and the nature loss, the war, the backsliding of democracies and increasing inequality. I could mention all the other words as well, regression of most economic uh, indicators, there is a need for a consorted effort to enhance governance and public finance, both at national and at global levels. State capacity to finance and implement policies for development in an open and inclusive process is often lacking in many of the low-income, fragile or conflicted affected contexts. And we know that developing countries have limited capacity to raise taxes and lose significant amounts, as we just heard, of public resources through corruption, illicit financial flows, as well as tax evasion. And for Norway, the tax issue is a major issue. Uh, the countries need a revenue. They need to, to be able to... Um, uh, serve, the, serve the people, serve the uh, society, and without taxes, they, they will not be able to do so. And in Norway, you may know, we pay a lot of taxes, but we also get a lot out of it. Uh, but to do so, and I think that is uh, an uh, element related to the integrity, uh, you need trust. And uh, in that integrity, it is uh, an inbuilt sort of assumption that uh, you also have trust and, and gain trust through what you are doing. Um, public engagement in policy processes is often lacking. And as is data and statistics, as you also mentioned, uh, that can inform development uh, processes. And we see that uh, significant political and economic incentives for elites to retain this status quo and their lack of commitment to improving governance is one of the main obstacles to progress. And we have to be open about it and we have to deal with it. And delivering on the SDGs by 2030, which I think we just have to change soon, uh, require governments to increase and transform government revenue mobilization and management into inclusive development through public service. That is the way you also can gain trust and you can somehow start building on, uh, uh, on your, all the elements of, uh, needed for integrity. Uh, we think that improved governance will contribute to increasing public revenues that can be used for government services instead of sort of siphon off to other countries. And it can contribute and strengthen so the social co contract, which is extremely needed if you are going to build a sustainable society. 
from the Norwegian side, we put then emphasis on the increased revenues from tax and tariffs, and within that, building the financial integrity in all elements of the, every chain, uh, every elements in the chain. We want support. We would like to support the multilateral and the bilateral engagement in building that capacity, and we do it through our support to uh, both to the World Bank, the IMF, but also through many of you sitting here. Uh, and you are the experts, you are the ones that are actually carrying out uh, all the uh, what's that, needed uh, activities to, to meet these challenges. And we really appreciate the work that you are doing uh, very much. Uh, we, we think that a lot of the uh, efforts that have um, uh, been done uh, the last, uh, let's say, decade, um, we should see the successes but there has also been some of the uh, uh, huge uh, challenges. Um, and that also comes from the political situation that we are living in now, which probably is going to put further, um, let's say, challenges on us. Uh, we see that countries need improved public finance management, and they need support to fiscal policy and pub publicly financial um, um, proper public uh, financial management, uh, a more comprehensive approach around core government functions, and uh, improved public procurement and contracting, in which we also have uh, experts on the panel here, so we will hear more about it. The, day, the need for statistical data was mentioned, uh, and we need that to take the right decisions. Uh, and we must uh, also build and continue to build on the standards and norms that we have for financial integrity. So they fit also the developing countries' needs and capacity. And not only is something that we do through the OECD countries that are sort of designed for another, another environment, I would say. And including in that, in that is also the beneficial ownership registries that needs to be tailored to countries' needs. So I hope that um, this... This panel will uh, provide ideas, and I, I'm also quite sure that it will. The discussion will show us how depending, dependent we are on each other, and the different roles that we can play in this. Uh, UNDP being a multilateral agency, I see World Bank sitting here. I see uh, the most vital uh, um, institutions being represented, and we need to join these forces. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lisa, for, for further setting the stage and, and uh, laying out so beautifully the sort of integrated nature of the challenges that we face in relation to financial integrity and governance issues and economic issues. And you also highlighted, I think, an important point about, you know, maybe we're heading into even further um, troubled waters in this space, and I'd be interested to hear the expert panel's view on that. I was reading reading up before the session, and I learned that research shows that overall challenging macroeconomic conditions contribute to illicit financial flight. So as we head into recession globally and within many countries, and with spiraling uh, levels of debt and reduced fiscal space in the countries in which we work, are we actually, you know, how is that going to be affecting these issues that we see and how are we gearing up um, to meet those challenges as well? Um, so, but that, I don't want to preempt the discussion, that brings us to the end of our, our opening remarks. And I, I should also say, again, thank you to Norway for your leadership in this space uh, across the range of issues on democratic governance, on tax, on illicit financial flows, and your consistent support, uh, multilateral and bilateral support. Um, it is well appreciated by many of us in, in this room. So thank you, thank you again to Norway for that. Um, you're welcome to stay or you're welcome to, 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 to go. Uh, we're turning now to our expert panel. We have five people with us today um, uh, and um, who are going to explore some of these issues and other issues further. First, I'm going to uh, turn to Tim Steele, who is a senior governance expert at the UNODC STAR initiative. 
The STAR initiative is the Stolen Asset Recovery Initiative, which is a partnership between the World Bank Group and uh, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime that supports international efforts to end safe havens for corrupt funds. So Tim, could you elaborate a little on the STAR initiative and, and other relevant initiatives and highlight the progress as well as implementation gaps you have identified in supporting countries? What could we do more as a global community to bridge those gaps on asset recovery? And I've asked the panel to stick to five to seven minutes for their initial intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. STAR Initiative was part of a suite of initiatives set up 15 years ago against the euphoria of the sort of large cases, three large cases really, Montesinos, Montesinos in Peru, um, Abacha in Nigeria, Marcos in Philippines. We thought asset recovery was going to be easy. Money was going to flow back. So at the same time, STAR and the International Centre on Asset Recovery were set up. They were meant to work together and meant to complement each other. Fifteen years later, they do. The purpose... <coughs> The purpose was to support implementation of Chapter 5 of UNCAC, the Chapter on Asset Recovery across the board, on the preventative side, but more specifically on the investigative prosecutorial side to facilitate the return of assets from one country to another. Uh, international Asset Recovery is Chapter 5. Article 31, just for com completion, completeness sake, is Domestic Asset Recovery. Um, I see a few people in the room who were around in those early days. You know, the very first thing we did at STAR back then was we set up protocols to stop too many countries applying for assistance. We thought they would be knocking at the door, there'd be countries wanting to give money back. That's not what really happened. Anyway, what, back then the first publication we did was on non-conviction-based forfeiture. To this day, non-conviction-based forfeiture remains a major problem. I'm not going to explain what it is, but if you want, anyone wants to ask the question, please do. In those days, 17 countries around the world had non-conviction-based forfeiture, and probably only the US and Ireland had very advanced systems. Now, I'm not sure of the number, but it is many times that. When we look at the recent country engagements, um, financial investigations remains high in the list of priorities. Well, what it actually means, I don't know. I'm a forensic accountant by background, and people throw around the term financial investigations. Everyone means makes something different. Really breaking it down into what it actually is, what we're actually trying to do, might make some sense, might help it fall down the list of priorities. One more recent addition on the financial investigations list, which does make a bit more sense to me, but again, it's very broad and wasn't really on the, on the agenda when we set up, is, is the use of open source material in investigations. A lot of countries are requiring help how to, how to obtain open source material. Sounds simple, not, not as easy. A Google search gets you 30, 40% of the information available on, on the normal web without looking anywhere else. Um, I think you'll hear an awful lot more about it coming up in the near in the next from next panelists. But beneficial ownership is a, is an issue, both for investigators, but countries also asking how to establish beneficial ownership registries, how to actually collect beneficial ownership data. Um, that hits one which may seem a bit more surprising, but is actually a major issue and is is interagency cooperation. A lot of countries have got to the point where, yeah, they've got interagency groups. I've, in this year alone, I've had at least 11 countries in three different continents say, say to me roughly the following. We've set up, we've set, set up interagency teams and we have meetings every month. And what we agree at the meeting is when to have the next meeting. And it's not actually getting operationalized. So it's very specifically how to operationalize that interagency cooperation. It's a really, really tricky issue. This is just from country engagement I'm talking about. Um, 
But the, the information we pull out of the country engagements is also complemented by a sort of asset recovery survey that started in 2019 of memory 78 responses so far. And the two major issues that countries identify are basically lack of response when you actually put through mutual legal assistance requests. Interestingly, that lack of response can be both ways. It can be both the country wanting to give the assets back and the country wanting to get the assets may not be getting a response. The other thing is actually back to beneficial ownership, identifying the beneficial owners of the assets. This is what comes out in the survey. Non-conviction-based forfeiture, the other things are in there, but those are the two real highlights. I believe I'm coming probably halfway through my five to seven minutes. That gives you a few things, but let me, let me say a few things for the future. Get more technically precise on what you're actually delivering, what, what we actually mean. You know, we throw out terms like financial investigations. What is it? Beneficial ownership, I mean, I'm sure there are many on the panel, certainly at least one, probably a few more on the panel who can talk a lot more about it than me. What do countries actually need to do? How, how is this actually going to wait, work? How do we make interagency cooperation work? It's brilliant, everyone meets together. But what, how do you actually make some sort of positive outcome from those meetings, which actually improves the operational efficiency? I talk about the proceeds of corruption. A lot of what I'm saying holds good for all illicit flows. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Tim, um, for both outlining some of the history for people like me who didn't know it, um, but also for setting some very clear, practical challenges on the way forward. Um, and I think you asked some really helpful and useful questions there. Uh, I'm going to take the privilege of the moderator and actually switch the order around a little bit of, of what we had, if that's all right with the panel, because I think you've raised the centrality of, of the beneficial ownership question. So it might be worth sort of digging into that a little bit. So actually, I'm going to turn next to Tom Townsend, if, if that's okay, who is the director of Open Ownership. Um, Open Ownership has worked with almost 40 countries to advance beneficial, beneficial ownership reforms, as well as supporting the creation of over 15 new central and sectoral registers for beneficial ownership transparency. So, Tom, what are the main challenges for countries to strengthen their legal and policy framework to promote beneficial ownership transparency? Um, thank you for having me, and um, good afternoon or evening, depending on your taste, um, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. Um, I think it's probably just worth putting in context a little bit sort of where we are in the kind of process of reform around beneficial ownership, because um, what we see and what we have seen as an organization over the last year or so is this massive uptick uh, in countries taking the first steps to put in place primary legislation to create a legal basis to compel a company to disclose who their owners are. Um, that is clearly the first step, and then typically a, a secondary or regulatory process to sort of codify that a bit more, specify the data fields that you're looking to get from companies and the process by which they might be verified, and so forth. There isn't, beyond sort of parliamentary or legislative time to do that and the political will to, to, to take the step to legislate, there's not a, there's not a huge amount of challenge in doing that. You know, we know what good legislation looks like. We know what the good aspects uh, or, or aspects of good legislation on beneficial ownership look like. And, and the sort of international standards on this are, are pretty clear. I guess the, the longer term or the next stage challenge really is, is around this issue of sort of what is this all for and is it delivering what we need it to? And that comes much more into the realm, I think, of what Tim's been talking about, which is a kind of an awareness across government of... of what you can do with this information, the power of knowing who ultimately owns something, and that point around interagency cooperation and people actually making use of it. I mean, one of the things that I find kind of extraordinary is that within kind of the broad brush of international standards on this, it wasn't until the last Conference of States Parties um, at UNCAC at the end of last year that there was a resolution 
and, and, and the sort of instantiation of any international standard that actually talked about using this information. So prior to that, we'd been sort of talking about standards that said you must implement something, but not actually compelling anyone to use it. So it's a good step forward, a kind of obvious one that you probably just would have assumed, assumed was implicit, but unfortunately it's not. I mean, I think about the United Kingdom, um, where I am from, um, had a beneficial has a beneficial ownership register that's totally unverified, and you wouldn't want to trust the information on it, I, I would warn you. Um, during COVID, there was no use of that information when assessing applicants to a kind of rapid financing scheme. So businesses could come and ask for money to, to pay for staff and so forth to get them through the pandemic, and rightly so. Y there have been a number of cases uh, brought, some successfully post-pandemic, uh, showing that companies that were established the previous day were applying for COVID relief money, saying they had 200 employees and a turnover in the tens of millions. You don't even need beneficial ownership information to find out that's not true. You just look at the date of incorporation, but no one was bothering to check. So this is the point, I think, around around use. And at the heart of all of that is, is the interagency challenge. And I think one of the areas that I think is the next frontier in all of this and something that we're turning our attention to now is just trying to um, find a broad coalition of agencies within government who are going to see the value for themselves in using this information and applying it to their work. I think I'm a former civil servant and you know interagency cooperations is sort of like an, a, a sort of unachievable nirvana in in many respects like it, it sort of will never happen all you can do is just on a sort of day to day week to week basis is try and align different agencies incentives to actually bother to turn up and not just agree to when the next meeting is going to happen albeit it's an important agenda point but we need to I think kind of <coughs> focus now on driving that use uh, making sure that we are clear with a whole range of government departments about how you can apply beneficial ownership data within their work. The most obvious and I think most pressing demand on this is in public procurement. Um, we're seeing a lot of interest from public procurement authorities to bring beneficial ownership data in at the point of bidding. So you're able to see uh, chains of shared ownership across multiple bids to a tender, for example, they do see value in that. So I think the challenge to kind of answer the question a bit more directly I I on the legal and policy side is sort of less not knowing quite what to do, because I think we do know how to do that now. It's going to be quite a, it's a long road to drive that use, raise awareness across different agencies of how this is valuable. When you talk to people and you explain it and you bring to life the use cases, the case studies, the things that other people have done, it, there's a light bulb moment normally. People people want to do it. Um, but that kind of long journey now to make sure that there is use um, and that we're constantly pushing a government to use it in all the different ways that they can from all of the different quarters, from everyone sat in this room, um, is going to be really critical. And I, I, I said this on a panel this morning. I think it's, it bears repeating. The best thing that everyone in this room can do to help the push around this, and I would assume we're all broadly on the same page about seeing better beneficial ownership disclosure in the world. Look at the case studies that we and a ton of other people publish about how this data gets used. Learn just one of them. And when somebody asks you, why does this matter, tell them that case study. We publish a load, OCCRP do, TI do, they're all out there. Just find one that you like, that resonates with you, and repeat that story again and again and again. That's probably the best way of overcoming that challenge of kind of delivery. Thank you very much, Tom. That was really clear and and focused us even further on on the challenge that the opening remarks and others said about you know how do we actually make progress on on these issues now? We know what to do in terms of legislation on this theme, and then how do you get uptake? Now, fortunately, the f next three speakers are all talking around about you know uptake and how do you get policymakers to change and and what different paths to that. So um, I'm going to turn next actually to another Tom, Tom Cardamon, who's the president and CEO of Global Financial Integrity, um, GFI, which is committed to engaging with policymakers worldwide to develop effective pragmatic policy solutions to address illicit financial flows. 
So can you please share your thoughts with us on key actions that should be undertaken at the global level to prevent illicit financial flows and also this issue of kind of uptake of what we already know needs to be done? Thanks, Tom. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, at the risk of giving us all maybe a new thing to work on, I'm going to float something for, for you all this evening. And it is very much uh, along the lines of what we all know already, is that opacity drives corruption. Opacity drives criminal activity and money laundering. And that is the facilitating factor. It's the dark places in the economy, the global economy, that enable all the illicit money to be flowing around the globe. Uh, whether it's anonymous shell companies or trusts or tax havens, it's the opacity that is the problem. The area I'd like to talk about this evening, where I think there is a large gap in global action, is in the area of international trade. Uh, just to start off with a couple of statistics, uh, the annual estimated amount of the value gap of trade misinvoicing uh, in international trade just among developing countries is $800 billion a year. Uh, the estimated amount of illicit trade is $2 trillion a year. Uh, this includes not just things you would ordinarily imagine are illegal, narcotics, weapons, those types of things, but legitimate products, legitimate goods that have been illegally harvested, you could say. Fish, timber, minerals, uh, counterfeit uh, goods, counterfeit, counterfeiting of legitimate goods, everything from handbags to aspirin is a trillion dollars a year in and of itself. It's, it's, it's just an absolute massive amount. Uh, money laundering, the IMF estimates the global money laundering is somewhere in the area of $3 trillion a year trade-based money laundering being a subset of that. And as you might imagine, because this is an illicit activity that's meant to be hidden, it's hard to get a real hard number on it, but it gives you the magnitude of the problem. Uh, so where is the opacity in this? Uh, first, uh, it's o opacity in ship ownership. Um, um, 90% of global trade is delivered by ship. 30% of the global commercial shipping fleet flies flags of convenience. Now these are, these are legal uh, entities. These are countries that provide a flag to a commercial ship without having that company domiciled in the country that provides the flag. Uh, this provides revenue to those countries uh, low taxes generally, low regulation, but also opacity in ownership. So 30% of the global shipping fleet has opaque ownership, at least. Uh, a, a massive problem. There is a lack of information between an exporting uh, customs department and an importing customs department. So the value of a particular shipment when it leaves the, the exporting country the importing customs department has no access to that information. So it's, it's incredibly simple to be able to manipulate an import invoice, manipulate the value, the quality or quantity of the goods to evade VAT taxes, customs duties, income taxes. There's tens and tens of billions of dollars a year lost to developing country economies because of this activity. So there's this gap, information gap, it's opaque. Um, free trade zones. Uh, these are areas uh, established around the world, some 5,000 of them, uh, with um, estimated 1,000 more on the drawing boards, uh, that are lightly uh, monitored, uh, very little transparency uh, in many cases, um, uh, very little accountability in many cases. Um, OECD, uh, UN, many agencies have done reports on this. We've done a report on it. RUSI has done a report on it to talk about the impact this can have on global crime, money laundering, 
um, uh, trafficking in all sorts of uh, goods and people. Um, so there's these, again, an opaque area, uh, sort of a subset of a country's uh, legal uh, territory where the customs departments have very little access. And one other area of uh, global shipping that uh, creates opacity, that is the ability of a ship's crew to turn off its global positioning system. Um, they go dark, as it's called. This allows ships to, in countries to get around sanctions. So if you're ever wondering how North Korea gets oil into the country or how Iran gets oil out of the country, it's because ships can meet somewhere, uh, turn their GPS or AIS systems as they're known off, they go dark, they transfer the oil and then it goes on its way. So, th so these are the key areas of uh, opacity that have to be addressed. Quickly, I'll go through some areas on how this is done. First would be a beneficial ownership registry just for global shipping, regardless of where these ships are flagged uh, or the status of a country's own BO registry. There should be a separate one uh, uh, organized by the International Mon uh, Maritime Organization uh, would be the lo logical place to do this. Uh, um, blockchain technology in every port. Uh, this would provide automatic and secure transfer of all types of uh, data on a particular shipment from the exporting country to the importing country. Very uh, uh, simple to do. The WCO has been talking about this for the last few years. There's been very little traction on it. Um, uh, a uh, a new push to get more um, uh, countries uh, acceding to a Kyoto Convention. This is a WTO Convention on Free Trade Zones. Uh, and essentially it says that a free trade zone, regardless of where it's located, has to give access to that country's customs department for oversight. Uh, it's just uh, oversight, transparency, accountability. Without this, without uh, a broad number of countries agreeing to this um, uh, convention, we're going to continue to see free trade zones acting the way they've been over the years. And then, essentially, uh, regarding the AIS systems, there should be a new global protocol uh, where this is not, uh, uh, where crews are not able to access the system in the first place. An airline crew cannot access the black box while they're in midair. Uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, and if you can do it on an airliner, uh, there is no reason why you couldn't do it in a commercial shipping vessel. So some very, uh, some very clear actionable steps that the international community can uh, begin to address as a way to create trade integrity across the globe. And at the end of the day, this reduces corruption, reduces crime, and increases revenue for developing countries that need it to try to achieve the SDGs. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Also, very clear recommendations of uh, we know what the problem is. We know some mechanisms to fix the problem. Um, uh, so, so the pending question, which I hope we can come to, is, well, what next? But I'm going to perhaps, uh, Arturo, maybe you can uh, help answer that question. Uh, next is Artur, Arturo Herrera Gutierrez, who is the Global Director for the Governance Global Practice in the Equitable Growth Finance and Institutions Practice Group, uh, Vice Presidency of the World Bank. Um, please do talk to us about how the World Bank fits into this set of challenges and on how good governance can promote financial integrity, prevent IFFs, money laundering and other forms of corruption. Sure, this should work. Okay, thank you and, and, and thank you for the invitation and, and the, the topics that you mentioned public financial management, uh, control of illicit financial flows, corruption, etc., are pretty close to the core uh, mandate of the governance practice at the World Bank. But, but they are actually also pretty close to, to some, some parts of my professional career. 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna make a, a very a very quick personal note to take it as an excuse to land it on what we are doing at, at the World Bank. Um, in 2004, I was the treasurer of Mexico uh, of, of Mexico City, and uh, as you may imagine, it was a, a, ma a massive payments operation. We have 300,000 workers, and, uh, and, and we were paying them pro suppliers to provide the services of about 8 million a city, a 20 million people uh, 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 metropolitan area. And we have these massive da data sets, but the regulation was not there. The budget and the payments were only authorized to process in a paper-based mechanism. So, so in order to trigger a payment, at some point, a paper needs to be signed. So not surprisingly, somebody set a series of papers with fake invoices and they were processed uh, millions of, of, of dollars. So at some point somebody called me and asked me, C -c -c can you stop those payments? And when we checked, those payments were gone, right? So my, my, my fair concern was, oh, I'm sure this, way, this, this went to, to, to ghost companies and the, and, and the monies are gone. So I, I, I called my people in IT and they told me, no, 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 this, these companies have been working with the government for a while. So that was my crash course on the connections between weak PFM, corruption, and illicit finance. And what was interesting is that you try to prevent that, but these things happen. And the interesting way is, then you, we need to try to find and to recover the, 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 the assets. And the police was not ready to that because, because it's, it's a very specialized world. It's about following financial transactions. So somebody, uh, a junior staff on, on, on my team, a mathematician, realized that we, 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 we made these payments to, the pro, to, to some supplier, but that supplier was also buying some services from the government, and they were in a different database. So they crossed the database, and we were able to identify what we now we call a uh, beneficial owner. And we were able to put that. Uh, that, that, that uh, soon after that, because this was a major scandal, I was promoted finance secretary. So I made sure that by the end of the year, we were only, only working with digital payments and systems. And that's actually, actually what we tend to do at the World Bank. We work very heavily in strengthening public financial management systems across us, all the cycle. It's not only budget, it's not only treasury, but they actually have to be connected to the procurement systems so that there is traceability in all, in all the process uh, uh, to, to, to what is going on with, 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 with public money. Moreover, it's relatively simple to open those, those, those systems so that there's some sort of check and balances from civil society in terms of determining who, who, who is get, getting what. We are doing a, 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 few, a few other things. I'm not gonna mention it because some of them, we are, we are doing it in, in, the, in the STAR initiative in our partnership with the UN, and th those were, were already mentioned. But probably, probably are, are, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take a, 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 a couple of minutes to mention where we are trying to move, uh, uh, to move the agenda now, and again, is this idea that you, you, you create robust, robust public financial management systems hoping that these are not happening, but you have to be ready to do something if these actually are actually happening. So pretty much like in my example of Mexico City of almost 20 years ago in which we were crossing different databases, now we're working with governments in terms of how different databases could be used to try to to, to, to track um, illicit financial f funds. And thus you have to, to use the procurement system that the government own, but the tax administration systems that a different agency of the government own, uh, the business registry uh, systems that will tell you when, when and where those, 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 those companies are created, and then artificial intelligence to help you to work with that. And it's, it's, it's a relatively new area, uh, 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 I would say, in the, in, the po in, in the public sector. We're working hard with that, but the results are looking really, really promising. Now, my sense is that after, after we have several of these exercises running, people who want to engage in these activities are gonna find a, a way around it, right? 
So, so, so what I'm trying to advocate with my team is that we need to take a regulatory approach to this, that we set a series of rules, et cetera, but we understand that we will, down the road, we will need to fine tuning and, and adapt it to the new ways to engage in corruption, in, 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 in the transferring of Ill, 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 illegal financial, fi financial funds, and we will need to adapt regulations, processes, and the way we oversee this. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that's the thing. Uh, actually, can you hear? Yeah, okay. Um, thank you very much, Arturo, for, for both you know, sharing with us your crash course in, in the topic and, and then uh, the World Bank's approach and the, use of, the important use of digital um, tools to, to help in this fight against corruption and the, as you emphasise the need for a sort of whole of government digital transformation to ensure that the different systems are talking to each other. But you also raised a very important point at the end, also I think about the need to learn and fine tune and share um, experience in this area as we are all uh, moving forward uh, on, the, on these different aspects. Um, uh, last but very much not least in this panel, uh, I'm going to turn to Fergus Scheel, who is the manage a managing editor at the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. And ICIJ has been central to a number of the big investigations which have put the issue of financial secrecy on the agenda of policymakers and broader populations. And I'm quite sure you have been uh, beneficiaries of the beneficial ownership, uh, or you have been using the beneficial ownership for the benefit of all of the rest of us. Could you please share with us a little bit of how ICIJ has done this and give us some thoughts on the next frontiers from your perspective? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, nice to see you all. Um, I'm the managing editor of um, ICIJ, which stands for the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Uh, the consortium is a terrible word, and people can never remember our name because of it, so hang on to that word. Uh, we are based not far from here, a few blocks away, and we are a small but formidable organization of journalists, IT specialists, um, and data experts. We uh, punch well above our weight. We are a truth-seeking missile. Uh, we have been responsible for the biggest uh, journalism projects in history. We have reinvented journalism. We are responsible for collaborative journalism. We have, uh, through our stories, returned more than a billion dollars to exchequers around the world. We've exposed hundreds of politicians. We've exposed narco traffickers, Ponzi schemers, fraudsters, murderers, and uh, we've done all of this on a shoestring. One of the ways that we do this is to um, gather huge collections of data and then ride them like crazy surfers. We have one of the biggest data collections of any news organization in the world, and I, we have done more on beneficial ownership than most governments in the world. We have um, uh, shared our beneficial ownership when other governments have hidden it, have uh, obscured it, have failed to do it. And so uh, we are proud of our efforts. We have brought down several governments. We have uh, sparked inquiries. And uh, again, we have done this with very little support. And so what I'm here to say to you is that truth matters. What journalists, journalists do matters. Uh, that if you really want to change the world, if you want to achieve even a fraction of what we have done with no money and hardly any staff, the way to do it is to seize truth, is to make your information transparent, to, make, to do away with opaqueness, to do away with legislative um, flim-flam, to do away with saying that you're going to do something when you're not going to do it or when you will only have to it, to actually to act, to act because it matters, and here's why it matters. In my head, my head is full of ghosts because my head is full of stories, and stories are ghosts, and ghosts are the, one, are the things that drive us all. When I was a kid growing up in Dublin, it was very poor. It was more poor than you can imagine for a European city. People lived in uh, Victorian tenements, that's how poor it was. Uh, the classrooms were huge, um, 
Uh, no one had a car, barely anyone had a job. When you came out of college, you, uh, if you went to college, if you were lucky to, you'd, you'd, you would go nowhere. One of the people that wasn't poor was a man called Christopher Keenan. Christopher Keenan flooded the streets of my neighborhood with heroin, and as a result, many of my neighbors died. I used to see on the way to university people in their pajamas, wandering like zombies, and they were dropping like flies, young people. Here's why Christopher Kinahan matters. A couple of weeks ago, myself and Maggie Michael, a reporter in Egypt, were able to focus on Mr. Kinahan, and we were able to show some of the offshore companies that he and his family owned. One of his sons is now one of the biggest figures in boxing in the world, was fated, was uh, championed, was on television, was uh, made a hero, whilst uh, poisoning Europe with narcotics. We were able to show through uh, the possession of documents that showed some of their offshore companies how they operated, how they operated through boxing, how they operated through agricultural companies, how they operated through pizza joints. And amusingly, a couple of weeks ago with the Irish Times and with our colleague Golden Matonga in Malawi, we were able to show remarkably how Mr. Keenan, the drug dealer of my childhood, was trying to buy nine military aircraft from Egypt and set up a uh, and a center for his activity in Zimbabwe. This is why this matters. This is why it matters, because if you do not have transparency, if you do not do it out with secrecy, if you do not seize the opportunities for evidence-based, rigorous, fact-checked journalism and more, the likes of Christy Heenan get away with it. They continue to poison people. They continue to grow rich. I also have in my head the kids in Luanda who were living by a poison stream, a stream that was so poisoned just outside the capital that when one of our reporters stood in it, he spent two weeks in hospital. Luanda, as you know, is the capital of Angola where Isabel dos Santos and her family have, you know, I don't know what the word is, you know, laid bare a nation. Um, Isabel dos Santos is still free is still moving around. Um, and there are other, countless other examples. In Garland, North Carolina, not from here, there's a kid who died of fentanyl. The money was moving from China to, to Canada, to, to Dallas, um, and, and we exposed that. In, 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 in California, there was a guy called Raymond Pacheco, 32, beaten to dead in the Napa Valley uh, because of a Ponzi scheme. In Mexico, where we just mentioned, there's you know, countless victims of narco traffickers. We have reporters all around the world that are on the run, on the run from, from, from governments and from mobsters. Um, and what we do matters. We were really touched that President Biden in his corruption uh, uh, push earlier this year mentioned journalism. It's really important. What we do is vital. I, I wish more people appreciated it. I know somebody here is from NORAD. We're so grateful to the Norwegian government and what they've done to support us. We can't speak more highly of them. And we hope that um, wherever we go, through our stories and through events like this, we can push the message that truth matters. It's hard to get at, but it really matters. And it matters uh, that everyone embraces. Thank you very much, Fergus, and for, for that and for also highlighting the really important issue of the safety of journalists. Um, you mentioned that you know, many of your colleagues are uh, living in fear as a result um, and of, of their work, and I think the figures of the deaths of journalists this year are higher than ever. And we don't, as an international community, talk enough about that um, about that aspect either. Um, thank you very much for for what for your contribution, uh, not just this evening, but for the contribution for you and your colleagues um, over many years um, in in highlighting truth and speaking truth to power. Um, 
that brings us to the end of the panel session. I think everybody's spoken. I messed up the order. So uh, I haven't left anybody out, I think. And I'm happy to say that we have uh, 20 minutes or so for questions. If you are joining us online and you would like to ask questions, please do write, write it in the chat box. Um, uh, we do have people monitoring that. But otherwise, I'll take questions from the floor, uh, probably a round of questions to start with, if anybody would like to raise their hands and speak. And we have some mics, some roving mics, I guess. Lisa, I see you first. Please go ahead. Thank you for breaking the ice. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the panelists. And my, my question would go to Tom. You know, Norway's, we have a few ships. Uh, so I guess we would be a target for maybe your new ID. How would you suggest that we could sort of pursue this, uh, both from the civil society and, and us from, let's say, outside the central parts of the government? What would be the steps to do? Uh, if there are any other questions, yeah, um, Ania, and I see the lady at the b over in the middle after that. Uh, thank you. I think, uh, I mean, all of you spoke about uh, obfuscation that comes with uh, the beneficial ownership uh, information and then the, the brilliant work that ICIJ is doing. I mean, I didn't know about this organization before, but it's brilliant work. Uh, so, two questions. Uh, I asked one of them earlier, also in one of the other panels. One is about uh, who's responsible for uh, developing the beneficial ownership uh, registry? I mean, is it the government? Is it private sector? Is it collaboration, regulation? I mean, exactly how is this done? I mean, people who want to do money laundering, who want to actually own assets across multiple jurisdictions, multiple countries, the, the, the whole intent is to obfuscate. So how, who actually enforces uh, clarity and uh, transparency there? The other question is about balancing between uh, privacy and uh, openness, right? So again, what is your take on doing that balance? I'm, I'm still searching for that. Thank you. Thanks. And there was a lady in the middle. Hi, my name is Catherine. I'm a Canadian lawyer doing a placement with uh, Transparency International Madagascar. So my question pertains uh, specifically to this this tracking, going down, you know, all the loopholes to really figure out, you know, who's the beneficial owner. In the case in Madagascar, the governments, those who are awarded government contracts, um, it's quite opaque. So even when civil society does end up tracking down, you know, who's the beneficial owner, if not always, almost always, these uh, the beneficial owners are um, located in offshore um, tax havens. And in the case of Madagascar, there is a DTAA, a double taxation avoidance agreement between Madagascar and Mauritius. So my question is, you know, we, we, we're going down the trail, we're, we're doing what we gotta do, but what happens next? What, where can we go from here? You know, we do the investigative journalism, but uh, where do we go now? Thanks. Uh, actually, the, the gentleman on the end had a question and then the lady in the middle, and then we'll go back to the panel. <coughs> Hello, uh, thanks for the opportunity and uh, for the panelists. I'm Paul Lemia from UNDP Tanzania. Yes, I would like to bring um, the discussion and uh, the context of Africa, um, more particularly on the issue of um, implementation of various measures to counter illicit financial frauds. And uh, looking at uh, money laundering in Africa, more particularly, it is, seems as a tool to silence activism. You know, sometimes the cases as connected, to, as connected to the journalism and the journalists theft. Many of the cases, they use ant money laundering cases as a tool to, to silence activism. So my question is, in the context of the developing countries, and more particularly in Africa, how can we reinforce integrity in the implementation of uh, uh, illicit financial fraud enforcement measures? Over. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Patricia. Um, I'm from Uganda, and I'm here with the Fact Coalition uh, based here in DC. I came to this session uh, hoping to find a linkage between the work done and the SDGs. 
because I know we are about eight to nine years to the time of the the reviewing, the 2030 coming close. So I, I think I missed that maybe if someone could just bring it out. Thank you. Great, let's go back to the panel with that set. There were certainly some for the two Toms, but others might want to come in uh, on any of the questions. Tom, this Tom, would you like to take the shipping one first, uh, plus anything else? Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the question. I think the, f I think the first point to make is that uh, large uh, shipping corporations that are publicly traded, we already know who owns them. Uh, so they wouldn't have to be part of this, uh, this list. Um, uh, how do you get it done? I think it's, it's a political will question. Uh, it's not a technological question. We know what beneficial ownership registries look like, so we have that platform already. We know who should probably operate it, the IMO at the UN, so they're already established. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, uh, it, so it's a, it's a, it needs to be brought into international discussions. OECD, G7, G20, uh, conversations with the EU. Um, the way the work we have all done over the last 15 or 20 years, it's, it's conversations with policymakers, making the case of why this is a problem, how you fix it, and uh, the potential revenue you can probably gain from it. And to the last question, this is where this connects with the SDGs. You start shining light in the dark places, it's, it's less likely money can get stolen, uh, moved, hidden, and laundered. Uh, uh, developing country governments that rely on natural resources for substantial amounts of their revenue can keep track of who's collecting, who's harvesting these resources. It makes it more difficult for uh, importers to uh, manipulate values on import invoices, so they uh, makes it more difficult to evade taxes, duties, and what have you. So this is what we're talking about. Eliminating opacity goes right to SDGs 16, 17, and if you do end up collecting that revenue, that enables you to achieve SDG 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So that's the linkage that, as we see it, between eliminating opacity and actually putting money back into the developing countries where it belongs. Thanks. Tom, the other Tom. Um. Yeah, to, to, to this question about um, who's responsible for, for doing this, I mean, um, the kind of very practical answer is typically it's a part of a treasury department or a company registry authority that will do that. But I think, I think the bigger point, and you pointed towards it about the sort of public and private side of things, is that fundamentally this is about changing a relationship between um, businesses and, and the state and what they're prepared to disclose. I mean, on this point, pick up on your point around privacy. I mean, setting up a business... Um, the state gives you rights that people that don't have a business have. You get to shield and limit your liability. Um, I think in return for that, what we're asking is that people disclose who benefits from it, and we should have public access to that. Um, that debate is very alive right now. Um, I think it's just, I think if we're referring to the, the European Court of Justice ruling a couple of weeks ago, I think it's just really important to note that Two things. One, that the European uh, member state response to that has not been uniform. We haven't seen everything go, go dark in Europe. Estonia, Latvia, France, for example, still open. So I think that's really important. Um, but the second part of that, I think, is to say that what that ruling says is that um, privacy is not an absolute right. It's contextually specific. And they're making a, pro a very narrow proportionality judgment, which is fair enough. You can do that. Um, that, proportion, that proportionality judgment is always a test. It's weighing the advantages against the infringement on privacy. I think the stories you're telling uh, give you a pretty clear sense of, of, of what we should be doing. We're not doing enough in, in, in that to counter the things that you're talking about. So I think the proportionality um, test is always a live one. Um, to just kind of uh, a, a sort of final point about what this kind of reform can deliver. Let, let's be really, really clear. Um, we are not 
here to, or we cannot build a register that eliminates crime. That's not possible. What we are trying to do, if you think about the kind of threat as, as an, you know, it's, it's intent plus capability. What we are trying to do here is continually raise the capability required to pull off these kinds of schemes. And at the minute, it, it's ridiculously straightforward to, to do that. Um, the more we raise capability to do that, the fewer people will be able to do it, the easier it will become to detect, the less noise you have as an investigator, um, and the more signal you get. So, so that's, that's the point of all of this. And I think one criticism that's leveled at kind of any reform in the anti-corruption space is sort of, oh, has it fixed it yet? Well, no, I, it, it hasn't, but this is the point. We, we make it harder. Um, but yeah, Fergus, I, I think privacy, you should talk about that. Uh, sure, uh, privacy is, is a great topic. Um, so uh, ICRJ takes privacy really important. Uh, re uh, we, we treat it really uh, importantly. We, we take it um, uh, uh, very, very seriously. So our offshore leaks database, which has hundreds of thousands of companies uh, that you can view publicly, anyone who just put into Google offshore leaks database and up it'll pop, and it's used by tax agencies around the world and governments. Um, we, we go to, um, uh, you know, a, a great lengths to make sure that pr people's privacy is not intruded on uh, through it by simply identifying the companies and the people that are behind the companies. That's it. We don't um, give people's personal addresses or details. All of you will have given away more of your privacy in the last week than we will have in the last decade because you all use Facebook and you use Twitter and you use Instagram. So I'm sorry to say, but your, your privacy is gone. You've given it to big tech and, and you're not getting it back. Um, so uh, so the uh, beneficial ownership registries really oughtn't to feature um, too prominently in an issue, in, in, in an argument about privacy, whilst privacy is very important. I, I would also say one further thing as a counterpoint. Many people are not aware of how big the illicit finance system is. Most people have no idea. It's not billions of dollars or millions of dollars, it's trillions of dollars that are flooding through high street banks every year. And these trillions of dollars pose a threat, not to your privacy, they pose a threat to your democracy. If you believe in democracy, this is something that you really have to get a grip on. Just a quick comment uh, to a colleague who made uh, uh, the question about the SDGs, and, and I think Tom, uh, uh, it's Tom, right? Because it's, there, are, there are so many, there are so many Toms that I'm sure I, I got it, I, I got it right. Uh, so, so Tom uh, mentioned two, two, two things. One, one is uh, the, uh, the SDG number 16 is uh, peace, justice, and strong, strong institutions. And by strong, what is behind a strong institution is actually the way in which a government works, including the public financial management systems that allow the government run, but also run in a way that it's uh, 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 that is robust to to, to, to risk of, of corruption. But then. There are two more aspects about it, and Tom already mentioned one is, is if, if, if resources are funneled from the budget uh, outside of, of, of the government, well, there's, there's less resources to devote it to fight poverty, hunger, etc. But there's a third one which my colleague Jim Anderson always, always remember me, and it's corruption er erodes. Uh, the sense of uh, social cohesion. So it has a, 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 an even further effect that affects all the, the, the mechanisms that help to achieve uh, the different SDGs. So, so, so it's really important. It's, uh, we may be biased because of the way, uh, the area in which we work, but we, we see it as, as deeply connected to SDGs. Uh, and when the SDGs were being put together in, in 2015, I think this was recognized and in fact, target 16.4 recognizes it explicitly and says, and aims to significantly 
reduce illicit financial and arms flows, strengthen recovery and return of stolen assets. So those who designed the SDGs as an integrated agenda recognized th these aspects that we've been touching on um, tonight, both in terms of the financial aspects, but also the peace, the, just, the justice and the inclusion aspects that underpin the whole of the achievement of Agenda 2030. Has anybody answered Paul's question? Um, have any of you, you know, come across occasions where this, uh, this push towards transparency and accountability, I think, Tom, you touched on it a little bit, but where it's actually being explicitly used to shut down activism uh, or, or shrink civic space rather than grow civic space? Um, I haven't come across a specific case of, um, well, I've heard of them of where money laundering cases have been a, a, a alleged to shut, um, shut down activists and, and silence people. I think we see it in the beneficial ownership space when it comes to um, disclosure around ownership, ownership of foundations and charitable organisations. This was a big issue uh, in the drafting of the Nigerian legislation um, in 2019 on this issue. So it is an attempt to um, bring foundations and NGOs into that reporting mechanism um, where it's very, for a whole bunch of quite sort of technical reasons, it's quite difficult. Well, you, you can't, there is no beneficial owner in, in, in many respects um, for, for one of those organizations, but it's an attempt to have an organization list out all the people involved in it in a very public way. Um, so so that, that, that's, a, that's a real challenge. They aren't beneficial owners, but it's an attempt to sort of create a listing for people who are participating in NGOs in, to some regards. So that, that's an abuse of it. I mean, um, who is the beneficial owner of the organization that, that, that I run. I mean, by any definition, nobody, but probably me. I exert control over it. Um, so that's how I see the specific technical uh, point around legislating for beneficial ownership be, be kind of weaponized. Um, and, and that is a concern to us. I think there are ways around it in the way that you draft things. But yeah, um, I think uh, so there are some governments we see around the world who sort of see this as a quid pro quo, which is like, oh, well, if we're going to make businesses disclose, then we'll, we'll also have a real go at annoying NGOs and foundations at the same time, and we'll probably get away with it. Tim, you wanted to come in? I mean, there's, I really want to say two things in that question about the use, the, the use of information to close down space. I come across it most weeks of the year, most days of the week. And if you think about the difficulty in putting whistleblower protection systems in, I mean, that's really people fearing information that they've, had, they've given in, in good faith to be used against them. And the very fact that we have to put protections, we have to put witness protections, it tells you there are people who are being persecuted for sharing information, for creating openness, for creating transparency. Um, Ferguson's point about journalists, same thing. Journalists being persecuted for creating openness. So yeah, the openness and the information is used against the people who create the openness. Case earlier this week, some of us had our phones buzzing overnight as we arrived here in a Southern African country the head of the Anti-Corruption Commission was arrested by a bunch of armed officers for having apparently shared information publicly. So her actions and the publicity of her actions were used against her, quite simply. Um, thankfully, that case was, the charges were dropped the next day after probably a bit of pressure, but you know, so we see it day in, day out. Thanks. We're drawing to the end and the end of a long day, I'm sure. Um, uh, are there any final um, questions? Or we have time for maybe a couple more to the panel. Um, please do raise your hands. Is there anything online? Nothing online. I see a gentleman at the back there. Uh, this may be a, a real stupid question, but I'm good at those. Uh, John Griswold with the Digital Economist and the Tech for Transparency Initiative. Um, the question, uh, Dean Fergus, is, I guess it's just recorded, so I've done it. I'll ask the question. Might there be anything to investigate about the integrity of the process that led to the EU high court decision on 
Um, I don't know. I don't know enough about it. It was a surprising decision. I think as a blank decision, it's, uh, you know, in my humble, non-legalistic viewpoint, it's a terrible decision. Um, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I wouldn't wish to cast aspersions upon the judge. So I don't, I just, There's no evidence to suggest, though. I've heard a couple of fairly smart lawyers saying that they think it's probably a legitimate decision based on the case. However, however it may be that we, there needs to be a re revisit of how we actually couch the beneficial ownership arguments. Okay, any final questions? If not, I'm going to turn back to the panel for any final one minute reflections. You, you don't have to, if you've said everything you want to say. But, but uh, if there are any wrap-up thoughts, um, I think we focused on, you know, what do we need to do next? We know, we know a lot of what, you know, we know a lot of what needs to be done, but what are the actual practical next steps to make them happen? Um, so if you have any final thoughts on, on that, you know, really practical things, we have, we have a range of, of people from a range of organizations in the in the room um what would be your top top one two maybe three actions that that you think the international community should take forward in one way or another tom you've already, you give, you've um, already given us a list I, I i did but i'm going to be a little bit more specific good uh, based on lisa's question uh, which would probably be, uh, first step might be the OECD, uh, given all the work they've done on illicit trade. They have a specific illicit trade program there. This would be a perfect thing to discuss within the context of that, of that body. And of course, we are going to be working with the U.S. government to see if we can get them um, uh, focused on this issue uh, in the context of our own port security and national security. Uh, because if you don't know who owns a ship, you probably also have very little idea of what's on the ship. Uh, so it's a national security issue from our perspective. And uh, if we can get traction on that, I think the next step would be to see if we can get it raised at the G7. Thank you for being very specific about you know, path, potential paths forward. Anybody else from the panel? Yes, probably uh, really quickly. Um, so how to implement this in, in countries? It, it really varies a lot because countries have completely different uh, uh, ca capacities. So, so things need to be crafted to what, what, what co countries are able to do and probably have an idea of where you want to be in the future and in the medium in the midterm but but we also need to be realistic about what we want how we want to achieve in the short term thanks tim i think two things first just remember that the perfect is the enemy of the good that we're not going to get everything right tomorrow and some progress is better than no progress and pick areas where progress is quite possible rather than fighting very hard fights. That's the first thing. The second thing is not just transparency so on beneficial ownership, but information on what's really going on in the world. It's been mentioned a couple of times. People, information is there, but it's not easily, often easily packaged to be accessible for people. And that allows a lot of what we see. I mean, some of some of the information, it just struck me when Tom was talking, this, this Tom was talking, <coughs> that there are several landlocked countries that have deep sea fishing fleets, for instance. Mm. I mean, if the public see that, I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous, but it's true. You know, so getting information out, getting people to understand <coughs> better what's really going on, I think would help a lot. Yeah, I, I would just say it would be nice to um, see nations learn from their neighbours and continents learn from their neighbours and um, to see Europe not rely upon America so much, um, to see something like FinCEN happen in Europe um, and to see a lot more pressure on the banks because the banks' compliance 
operations are hapless and and of course to support uh, wherever possible beneficial registries. One last comment about, just to follow up on Tim's, um, Liberia's uh, ship registry office is based about 40 miles from here in Northern Virginia. Uh, so you get this ridiculous type of thing happening to the you know casual observer. It just doesn't, there's no logic behind it. And I think we have to use a lot of those stories, a lot of those arguments uh, to the policymakers. Just make the point that there's real no logic to this, and not only is there no logic, but it can be quite harmful as well. Okay, thanks. So uh, it's been a really rich discussion tonight. Um, we started with looking at the the you know the global picture, the the size, the scale um, of the problem. Um, and I hope we linked it to some of the, you know, the broader development challenges and the SDG question as well. But then we've, I think we've dived into some very specific areas, which I found absolutely fascinating. I've learned a lot. Um, uh, and I think there's some quite practical areas to take forward. Um, it's, it's not all bleak and hopeless. Uh, there are things that can be done and paths to be pursued. Um, and I'd like to thank all, everybody on the panel tonight um, f for, for elaborating those, for sharing their experience, and for sharing also the passion for the work that they do. Um, I've, um, and I hope that everybody has found it as informative and interesting and useful as I have. Thank you very much. <laughs>